Excited to have you here. It wasn't my problem, so thank you very much. Delighted to have you here, and we're going to sit in silence for a moment and hear the prelude from Eldon, and then we'll begin our worship. Welcome. Glad to have you here. And if you're watching online, glad to have you here. We hope you'll check in, give us your name and where you're watching from, and that way we can see in the comments who we're hitting uh, across our fine valley and hopefully across the country. So welcome and good morning. Good morning. Please join me in our Eucharist today on page 355 of your Book and Common Prayers. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly kingdom, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. O oh God, you declared your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Israelites wander in the wilderness, wondering if God has forgotten them. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. 
the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb, at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. We'll read Psalm 78, verses 1 to 4, and Travel 16 in unison. Hear my teaching, O my people. Incline your ears to the word of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will declare the mysteries of ancient times, that which we have heard and known, and what our forefathers have told us. We will not hide from their children. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of the Lord, and the wonderful works he has done. He worked marvels in the sight of their forefathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zon. He split open the sea and let them pass through. He made the waters stand up like walls. He led them with a cloud by day and all the night through the glow of fire. Wilderness, and gave them drink as from the great deep. He brought steams out of the cliff and the waters gushed out like rivers. Christians in Philippi are encouraged by the creed of Jesus Christ with the apostle Paul shares in the body of his letter to them. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If if then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being a born in human likeness. And being found in the human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Be 
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the, sun, the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of their father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. Let us pray. Eternal God, you are the light of the minds that know you, the joy of the hearts that love you, and the strength of the wills that serve you. Grant us so to know you that we may truly love you, and so to love you that we may truly serve you, whose service is perfect freedom, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Jesus said to them, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. And the father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? Before we in internally align or assign our personal attitudes and or behavior with one or the other of these two boys, let us recognize that neither of these sons actually acted admirably in the story that Jesus tells. The first son, who initially refused to work in the vineyard, did not act admirably because he disobeyed his father publicly, thereby shaming his father in front of his neighbors and peers and employees. To disregard his father so lightly in that culture amounts to a form of character assassination. Actually, the son and the father both would have been regarded with contempt for the son, the son for acting the way he did, and the father for allowing such insolent and insulting behavior. The second son, and we presume the younger, because in that culture the father would have asked the older son to work first, the second son assures the father, oh, he will do as he asks. He will work in the vineyard but then fails to go. We don't know why he doesn't go. We just know that he does not do what he promised his father he would do. So he lies to his father, perhaps shaming him privately. You see, if the father, and he most likely did, have other laborers in the vineyard, they certainly would have known about the failed promise of the second son, and the vineyard would have been abuzz with gossip, a lying son and a father who lets him get away with it. So we can clearly see that neither of these youth acted admirably here. The parable praises neither son. But something we didn't hear read in the gospel this morning is that while Jesus is telling this story, 
He is physically located in the temple, teaching any and all who would listen. Typically, that meant large crowds would have been gathered around a seated Jesus. And also in the temple would be the chief priests and elders of the nation. This would have included scribes, those are the Hebrew scripture scholars of that time, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, members of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Judean people. A little more powerful than an HOA. These religious leaders are the listeners to whom Jesus asks, what do you think? Not just the people he was teaching. Let's step back for a moment. Have you ever noticed that in, in the gospel, Jesus rarely has trouble with sinners? <laughs> his trouble usually comes from the religious leaders of his own religion. People who, by their status and position, thought they were above others in God's economy of salvation. They looked down on people they considered as less pious and more sinful than themselves. In the minds of the religious leaders, they didn't need to respond to the preaching of John the Baptist, for they considered themselves as already having their ticket punched to the kingdom of heaven, so to speak. But Jesus tells these religious leaders that tax collectors and prostitutes, two of the worst type of sinners imaginable in that day, were indeed heading into the kingdom of God before they were because of their self-righteous refusal to respond to God's call in the preaching of John the Baptist. Once again, in today's gospel lesson, the writer reinforces a point made earlier in Matthew in the seventh chapter during the Sermon on the Mount. There Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. End quote. Apparently, just being friendly with Jesus to the point that we feel comfortable enough to call him Lord or Sir, as the Greek word gets rendered in today's text, isn't a guaranteed ticket into the kingdom of God. But doing the will of the Father, doing what God asks us to do, that is definitive proof of what you speak, says Jesus in today's lesson. It's one thing to say the right words. Acting on them is another thing entirely. Let me ask you, do you know about or remember the Whiskey Priest, the main character in Graham Greene's wonderful little novel, The Power and the Glory? Any of you remember that character? Wonderful book. It's okay, I'll tell you how it goes. This Catholic priest is desperately hiding from the Mexican authorities during the 1940s in this particular state in Mexico where their church has been outlawed completely. The police are giving all the priests that they find the choice between the firing squad or holy matrimony. At any rate, this one last priest, our hero, seems to continually elude the authorities. But throughout the novel, he can neither, neither successfully enter a neighboring state in certain safety, nor successfully quit drinking and enter the state of sobriety. By his own admission, he's a bad priest, a sinful man and far from holy. He knows it, everyone else knows it, and in one case, the evidence of his moral failure mocks him to his face. Some villagers are even dying because of him, taken as hostages and being shot by the police for refusing to give him up so they can still secretly have access to the sacraments of the church. And these firing squad deaths of peasants add even more guilt and pain to his drunken brokenness. And yet, at several points in the story, when the opportunity to save himself opens before him like a path, the whiskey priest refuses to walk down it because duty calls. Someone needs the services of a priest. And he believes that bad priest or not, he is still a priest, called and set apart to serve others in God's name. And so he goes, and he blesses, and he baptizes, and he celebrates mass in secret, praying all the while that God neither save nor spare him, but rather save those whom he serves. In effect, 
the whiskey priest says, no, I will not, to the outward life of righteousness and moral behavior, but in fact, begets true righteousness as he exercises his ministry, helping others pursue the righteousness of God in the difficult times of persecution. For it is one thing to say the right words, quite another thing to live them. In this day and age, in, I'm sorry, in his day and age, for Jesus to say that tax collectors and prostitutes who had entered the kingdom of God before the religious leaders of his nation would have been an overwhelmingly offensive things to, thing to say to the chief priests and scribes and elders, blasphemous at the least, scandalous and risky beyond doubt. You know, such a statement might have even shaken the credibility of Jesus and his message in some people's minds. And yet, can you imagine Jesus pausing to consider what other people might think of him or his actions over and above doing the will of his Father in heaven? No, I don't think so. Sisters and brothers, the things we perceive that hold us back from living boldly in Jesus' name, the thoughts and fears that restrain us from doing what the Father calls us to do, all pass away the moment we count them as nothing compared to the life that is to come and can be lived now. Let me explain my reasoning. Since 1990, I have become widely read in the field of near-death experiences. These are events wherein a person dies has an experience of leaving their body and going into a spiritual plane of existence. They call these NDEs. Many people meet Jesus or other heavenly beings, and then usually, against their own wishes, they are told to return to this life because they still have things to complete. And immediately, they find themselves back in their body that they'd left only moments or minutes ago. Although sometimes it seems like they've been gone for hours, days, or weeks. One other common characteristic of an NDE is that people often go through a life review wherein they take a look at their entire life in a matter of moments. Now, some people might equate this with the final appearance before the great judgment seat of Christ, but that is not the case. Life reviews typically are not a negative experience. And since I've been reading countless pages of literature in this field, and for several years now, I've been entertaining a notion, a theological idea, and that is this. What if, when we die, our final judgment will not consist of rehashing the things we did in life that were bad, wrong, or sinful? You know, the stuff that already keeps us from loving ourselves and thereby loving God and loving neighbor fully and confidently. But what if our final judgment will consist of looking at the things we might have done but didn't? Where perhaps we could have made a huge difference, but out of fear of what somebody else might think, we chose not to act or speak up or give generously of our time or money where we could have loved profoundly and experienced overwhelming acceptance and love in return, but instead withheld love. What I'm suggesting is, is what if our final judgment before God will be a look at our missed opportunities and not our misdeeds? I'm not sure which judgment would feel worse. Sisters and brothers, the gospel today presents us with a call to avoid complacency, thinking that we have already arrived, ticket in hand for heaven, and to recognize the attitudes within us that we need to overcome. The gospel is a call to grow further into a Christian who does what God asks us to do. And God is daily asking us to work in this vineyard if we only pause to listen, to open our eyes and see, to open our ears and hear. This gospel is a call to focus our attention 
on following Jesus, on doing the things that we see him doing, leaving behind the fears that constrain us and moving boldly ahead into grace-filled action. And it is also a call to join hands with the two brothers of the vineyard, with the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees, and that little whiskey priest, and all the tax collector and prostitute friends of Jesus that we can find as we journey together through this life, and one day, straight on into the kingdom of heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is only when we love one another that we can truly say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seen at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People of Form 4 are found on page 388 in the Book of Common Prayer. Page 388, Form 4, Prayers of the People. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Jennifer, our bishop, for Brian, Debbie, Gary, Jeff, Janet, Meg, Janice, Juan, and Timothy, our clergy, for Cecily and Sharon, our licensed slave pastoral care ministers, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, we give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, 
that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. We acknowledge the traditional peoples of the land on which we worship, and we pay our respects for them for the care of the land. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all those whose lives are closely, closely linked to, other, linked to ours, ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Let us pray for those celebrating the birthdays this week. Dorothy Helen and Elmager, Mildred Mallet, Heath Morrow, Micah Delora, Paula Rutilli, Patty Hurst, James Nord. And we give thanks for the anniversary of Juan and Liz Nagy. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, remembering especially those who we now name, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with, the, with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for all guests today that are joining us online that they might experience a warm welcome and encounter God's love and peace in our worship. For all the people on our parish prayer list and those dear to us whom we now name, either silently or aloud. That God's will for them may be fulfilled and that we may be instruments of reconciliation, healing, and peace. We pray for the men and women, women of our armed forces and other national service, for doctors, nurses, all hospital personnel, and all first responders and their families, and for all troops and civilian, civilians in harm's way in regions of conflict around the world. We also pray for those affected nationwide and around the world by the coronavirus by natural disasters, and by civil unrest. We pray for our companion diocese, the Episcopal Church in Navajo land, Bishop David Bailey, for All Saints Episcopal Church, Farmington, New Mexico. In our diocese, we pray for the life, work, and ministry of Trinity Episcopal Church, Kingman. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion upon the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggles and confusion to accomplish your purpose on earth that in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, it is only when we love one another that we can truly say, excuse me, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please give others a sign of peace without touching, please. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I'm going to take my mask off. Please be seated. So again, welcome. Glad to have you all here. I think we're a full house, right, Pat? We got 44, okay, plus with us, that's, that's, that's everybody. Okay, great. Um, what's the future look like? The next possible thing would be we're in what the diocese calls phase two. That's what is allowing 50 people to be at worship. If they go to phase 2.5, and I'm not making that up, it really is phase 2.5, 2. I think they'll let us have 100 people in here. But we still have to spread out, and I think we can do that if we are careful. We've got a way to sit you staggered in rows so that you would theoretically be six feet apart from each other. Even if you may be in a row behind somebody, you won't be immediately behind somebody. You'll be six feet down the row. So. Stay tuned for that excitement, <laughs> but, uh, but that would be great if we could have 100 people. That'd be excellent. So um, we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're watching, if you are watching. Uh, as I said, for communion, um, the ushers are going to, I think we said they're going to come out this side and this side, right, and kind of circle around that way, Pat? Yeah. So this side will be dismissed. On, they'll be myself. guided to the altar rail from the center aisle, this side from the side aisle. Okay, and also uh, after doing last week's dismissal, we decided that um, you let the ushers dismiss you from the end of each pew and you can just go out the nearest door. So you on this side, please go out the east door and then you guys on this side can go out the west door. Just to make it a little, there was a bit of a bottleneck and we think we can do that without any difficulty. Um, the one thing we can't do is just congregate outside and have good old-fashioned coffee hour. Well, by the way, though, on, on think on 2.5, they're going to let us have some form of coffee refreshment. Um, so stay tuned. That could be exciting, and hopefully that will happen within the near future. Kathy Shires is ready to make food for you all again. I, I, can wait. I can't wait for the bacon. She makes the best. She, you had bacon today? I'll be right over. I'll be right over. I have vestry. I could use a snack before vestry, but... I digress. At any rate, so at communion, let the usher come and get you. Uh, again, um, you just don't go up there when somebody else is up there and just circle back around. We ask you, too, to keep the bread in your hand to you get back to your seat and then lift your mask and take the bread so you're not pausing right there to commune, uh, to, take, to consume the bread. Um, and then for the benefit of the people who are watching at home, we thank you for watching. We'll do the prayer of spiritual communion followed by the actual post-communion prayer for those of us who were able to receive. So... Um, Meg Lewis will be over here giving communion. Deacon Meg, I'll be over there. And Janice will take care of gluten-free. If you need a gluten-free, just come right here. And Janice will let you pick one out of the ciborium. I don't think there's anything else. Eldon, we're grateful you're here to play uh, opening music and anthem here right now. A little music here at communion. So thank you for that. Always delighted to have Eldon. He's been amazing during this whole thing, Wednesday night and stuff. Yes, I think we should thank Eldon. So. So my turn is to cue the deacon with the offertory sentence. I will get out of the way. Let us offer our gifts as seeds. May we plant and water them with God's help. May God's grace yield a harvest of a new life for each of us.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us into a new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy God. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and became subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of the new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Please join with me the prayer for spiritual communion in your bulletin for those that aren't able to be here. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive in your sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart cleanse and strengthen me with your grace and Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you as you live in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray, pray our post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the fire of Christ consume you in all indifference toward God. The light of Christ illuminate our vision of God. The love of Christ enlarge our loving for God. The grace of Christ empower our service to God. And in the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Praise be to God. Please be seated.